Today's video is sponsored by Incogni, of whom more later. And now we continue the tale of Charles Tyson Yerkes, the entrepreneur who transformed transportation in London. To his supporters he was the Titan or the Traction King, to his detractors the Robber Baron or the Carpet-Bagging Brigand. There were plenty of people in both camps, and indeed there still are. When we last checked on him, he had bought out the District Railway and fought a battle with the Metropolitan Railway over electrification. There were wins and losses on both sides, but this was only one of the battles he was fighting. In the 1890s, London was in the grip of tube mania. Central London had largely been missed by the main line railways, due to the findings of the Royal Commission on Metropolitan Railway Termini. This commission had decreed in 1846 that no more railways could be built through the central area for fear of the city being carved up by viaducts and cuttings. There were occasional exceptions to this, but on the whole the rule was followed. The Metropolitan Railway got around this by placing their railway below street level. But the method of digging it, known as cut and cover, involved huge amounts of disruption and demolition and could be very expensive. The Metropolitan Railway's rivals, the District Railway, had nearly gone bankrupt this way. In 1890, though, the City and South London Railway came along, and that did things differently. It ran in a tunnel far below ground, and was powered by the new-fangled electric locomotive. This caught the interest of speculators and entrepreneurs alike, especially when the new railway began turning a profit. The conditions below the City and the West End were uniquely well suited to the digging of tunnels. London is built on clay, which is soft enough to dig through easily, yet solid enough to hold its shape until the tunnel can be reinforced. Tunnels could be dug cheaply. It was as if a new seam of gold had been discovered, one that could be reached by tunnel. A whole raft of proposals were put forward for new tube lines over the next couple of decades. There was the Brompton and Piccadilly Circus, the Central London, the London Central, the Great Northern and Strand, the Waterloo and City, the City and Brixton, the North West London, the Piccadilly and City, the North East London, the Baker Street and Waterloo, the London United Electric, the Great Northern and City, the City and North East Suburban Electric Railway, the Edgware Road and Victoria, and many more. But that initial enthusiasm didn't translate into firm financial commitments. Most of these proposals disappeared, either in the face of competition from other proposals or simply through a lack of money. But if there was one thing Yerkes was good at, it was raising money for failing railways. If Yerkes was interested, the investor community was interested. Oh, on the subject of interest from shady characters, that reminds me. A good way to deal with them is through today's sponsor, Incogni. Not all thieves are flamboyant men with big moustaches. Back then they had their eye on railway lines. These days they have their eyes... online. Do you see what I did there? You see, websites have this nasty habit of harvesting your data. Yes, even when you click on that button telling them not to. Seriously, take a look at your cookies sometime. That data gets sold to information brokers, and from there it could end up anywhere. Banks, businesses, insurance companies, governments, and if a data breach occurs, literally anyone who knows how to look for it. Incogni is here to combat that. You see, these websites have a little problem. Legally, if you ask them to get rid of the information, they have to. Of course, they don't make it easy, so Incogni automates the process and keeps you updated on it. I was more than a little freaked out when I learned how many people had my info on file. If you're curious yourself, the first 100 people to click the link in the description below and enter the code HAZARD can get 60% off. Now back to the robber barons of last century. They may have been scoundrels, but at least we got some railways out of it. The first tube railway to attract Charles' attention was the Charing Cross, Euston and Hampstead Railway. This received parliamentary authorisation in 1892. The scheme was what it sounds like, a line from the South Eastern and Chatham Railway's terminus at Charing Cross, across central London with a branch off to the London and North Western Railway Station at Euston, then up through the northern suburbs to Hampstead. British investors, though, were reluctant to put the money up, and therefore representatives were sent to America. We don't know exactly how Yerkes first became involved, but it seems likely that he was in on it by 1899. 
In 1900, he bought himself a position as chairman with the purchase of £100,000 worth of shares. First order of business was planning extensions. Hampstead was good, but Yerkes wanted to extend further, to Golders Green and Kentish Town. There are all sorts of colourful stories attached to his early involvement. One says that on his way over to Britain, he rhapsodised about his dream of opening up the city to a woman he'd just met. Another says that he took a coach out over the fields north of London, stopping it at an apparently arbitrary point and declaring that this would be his terminus. Another states that on Hampstead Heath he was reconnoitring with the company vice-chairman, and upon looking down over the sunlit city he declared, on the verge of tears, Davis, I'll make this railway. The reality was that he saw Golders Green as a potential market, a new suburb that would centre upon his railway. The concept of building a railway to nowhere in the hope of prompting development was considered fairly novel in Britain, although not unknown. But in America, it was standard practice for the builders of streetcar lines. It was a practice that would certainly catch on in Britain. Yerkes had no trouble convincing investors of his ability to, as it were, make this railway. In fact, he raised so much money that he was able to get another two schemes going in 1901. One was the electrification of the district railway, which I talked about in the previous video. The other was the Brompton and Piccadilly Circus. The story of the Brompton and Piccadilly Circus up to this point was similar to the Charing Cross, Euston and Hampstead. A proposal authorised in 1897 stalled for lack of funds. But Yerkes believed there was potential, particularly considering two other schemes that had his attention. The first had come with his acquisition of the district line, and was a deep-level express tube line, once again authorised but unbuilt. The second was the Great Northern and Strand Railway to run from Strand to Wood Green. Combining these three lines would create a line all the way from the affluent suburbs of West London through the West End, skirting the edge of the city and ultimately running out into the developing suburbs of North East London. With the help of the financier Edgar Speyer of Speyer Brothers and the Old Colony Trust, he set up a new syndicate, Underground Electric Railways of London, UERL for short. But even this wasn't enough, for there was yet another line ripe for the taking. This one was the Baker Street and Waterloo. Incorporated in 1893, this had had assistance from another shady character. One James Whittaker Wright of the London and Globe Finance Corporation. The London and Globe specialised in mining, so they were not only a good source of funds, but of expertise in digging holes in the ground. After their takeover in 1895, all seemed to be going well. Construction was begun in 1898. Confident of their success, they applied to extend their original proposal to Paddington in the north and Elephant and Castle in the south. What could possibly go wrong? Well, in retrospect, there were red flags. Wright tended to favour a certain kind of person for the boards of his companies. The kind of person who didn't like to do a lot of work. The kind of person who trusted easily. The kind of person who didn't have a whole lot of experience in the company's business which was fine as long as the money kept rolling in. But remember I said that British investors weren't enthusiastic about rail? Well, Wright found that out the hard way. He issued bonds, and no one wanted them. And so he announced to his shareholders that dividends would not be paid out for 1900. Which seemed a little weird. I mean, the companies were successful, weren't they? Well, it turns out not. Wright propped his companies up by borrowing money from his other companies. It appeared on paper that they were all making far more money than they actually were. The investigation into the case of the missing dividends brought this to light. It was fraud, plain and simple, and Wright was arrested. Awaiting his hearing at the Royal Courts of Justice, Wright took a cyanide capsule and ended his own life. Still, every cloud has a silver lining, or at least it does if you're Charles Tyson Yerkes. And in March 1902, UERL acquired the Incomplete Railway. It would be the first of their deep-level tube lines to open. But what of those other schemes? The Brompton and Piccadilly Circus, the District Deep Level Line, and the Great Northern and Strand? Well, here, Yerkes would meet his most formidable enemy. A man very much after his own heart. John Pierpoint Morgan. J.P. Morgan was one of the most famous financiers in America, a multi-millionaire who embodied the Gilded Age. 
he controlled countless companies, or at least I'm not counting them. These did include 21 railways, and it's not entirely surprising that he should therefore take an interest in tube mania. He backed a proposal known as the Piccadilly City and North East London Railway. This company would find itself in opposition to Yerkes, ironically because of Yerkes. The key to this was London United Tramways, founded by the entrepreneur Sir George White. As the name suggests, London United was all about building tramways. Tramways, of course, were also where Yerkes had got his start in the transport game. White and Yerkes both had their eyes on the suburbs of West London, but Yerkes had the advantage that with the district railway also running into West London, he could provide a complete service. So White decided to form an alliance with Morgan. Morgan had the Piccadilly and City Railway and the North East London Railway, and with White he formed the London United Electric Railway. These three, in turn, were united to form the Piccadilly, City and North East London Railway, which would largely parallel Yerkes' scheme. Have you got that? Things were looking good for Morgan. The tables were turned. He had an experienced ally and a firm plan. But he made a fatal mistake, and that was rudeness. Now, these days, rudeness is a tactic commonly adopted by stupid people because they think it makes them look clever. I blame TV. But it's never been a way to get ahead in business. White and Morgan disagreed on how much of a share London United could get in the PCNELR. Man, even the abbreviation is ridiculously long. Morgan believed that they should have a minority share as they were only contributing a third of the costs. White believed they should get more because London United was key to getting the railway built. Morgan, rather arrogantly, refused to negotiate or even respond to White's letters. White was furious and declared, Nothing on earth would induce us to continue doing business with that firm. He had had enough and looked to sell up. According to Speyer, UERL was approached by London United in 1903, offering to sell them a majority shareholding. Whether it was pragmatism that drove White to sell his shares to Yerkes or pure spite, both parties got what they wanted. London United, now part of the UERL family, pulled out, giving Morgan no time to amend his tube schemes. Parliament gave him the boot and gave Yerkes their approval. Now the way was clear for Yerkes to combine his own lines into the Great Northern, Piccadilly and Brompton Railway. With three deep-level tube lines under construction, standardisation could be brought in. The new lines would use the same electrification, the same construction techniques, the same rolling stock, the same architecture. Where lines met, they could share stations. Tickets could be issued across lines. It was a new and thoroughly modern way of doing things. It would form the basis of the modern underground. Now, Yerkes had the makings of an empire. His schemes covered much of London. The only part that he didn't occupy was the south, and he wished to extend there and even down to the channel. At this point, who was to say whether this was an unrealistic aim? The man seemed unstoppable. Until one day in 1905, he was stopped. On the 29th of December, at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, the Titan expired from kidney disease. And it was in death that his final scheme would unravel. Despite his many victories, his miles of track under construction, the investors he held in the palm of his hand, it was all a juggling act. A complicated web of finance and corporations, that baffled even experts. In reality, Yerkes should have been bankrupt. After his death, much of his estate was used to repay money borrowed from UERL. Not that UERL was doing well either. There were three lines under construction and none of them making any money. The Baker Street and Waterloo and the Great Northern Piccadilly and Brompton eventually opened in 1906, with the Charing Cross, Euston and Hampstead following in 1907. Traffic on these lines, and the newly electrified district, did not meet expectations. In desperation, new management was brought in by the shareholders. Albert Stanley of the New Jersey Tramways, and George Gibb of the North Eastern Railway. Gibb, in turn, recruited his colleague Frank Pick as commercial manager. Between them, they managed to save the underground group. UERL would acquire more transport concerns, only ceasing to exist in 1933 when it was absorbed by London Transport. At this point, though, the syndicate basically was London Transport. So, what sort of a man was Charles Tyson Yerkes?
A visionary genius who turned pie-in-the-sky plans into action, or a smooth-talking con artist only out for himself? I'd argue both, and that was the key to getting his lines built. An engineer might not have the business acumen to encourage investment. A pure speculator wouldn't have the technical knowledge to instil confidence in Parliament. He had a track record when it came to track, and he was willing to put his own money on the line. He conned people into believing he could improve transport by actually improving transport. It's no wonder that even after being twice disgraced in America, he was still able to talk others into going along with him. We cannot give him sole credit for the underground network, of course. We'll never know how a tube network actually run by Yerkes would have gone. Had it not been for Perks, Speyer, and later Gibb, Stanley, and Pick, his schemes would likely have collapsed like those that came before them. Or worse, London would now be undercut by miles of unfinished tube line, an embarrassing footnote in railway history. Still, he was the man who started it, the one who came to London and laid the foundations of the modern underground system and indeed the whole of London's transport. In less than five years he changed London forever, and for better or for worse we feel his legacy to this day. Well, I hope you enjoyed this ambivalent tale from the Tube. If you did, please do leave a like and consider subscribing for more. I would like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon, and here on YouTube as ever, for your generous support. You are the suspect loan to my suspiciously profitable company. Thanks also to Incogni for sponsoring this video. Check out the link in the description below to take advantage of their generous offer. And I will see you all again very soon for another Tale from the Tube.